All right, I think we're ready to get started now. Like I said, I'm Lucas Wavert with PASA. Um, we can go to the next slide. And I uh, wanted to welcome everyone here today. I'm glad you guys could all be attended and it's great to see uh, how close and how far everyone is. Uh, so thanks for, for saying in the chat where you're all based out of. Next slide. Uh, like I said, I'm Lucas Waybright. Um, our, our presenters today, um, want to thank them for their taking their time. Um, I'm proud to introduce Hannah Smith Brubaker, PASA's Executive Director and owner of Village Acre Farms, Chris Pierce of Heritage Poultry Management Services, as well as a member on the CPLE board, and Mike Badgers from American Pasture Poultry Association and Badgers Millside Farm. I also wanted to thank our sponsor today, um, the CPLE. It's uh, wonderful that we can have these type of partnerships within agriculture and uh, take advantage of, of organizations and timely issues um, like what we're going to be talking about today. So with that, I will let Hannah take it away. Thank you, Lu Lucas. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am Hannah Smith Brubaker, Executive Director of PASA. Um, for mostly most purposes today, I'm, I'm talking as a farmer from Village Acres Farm. In addition to being an organic produce farm, we also raise about a thousand laying hens on pasture each year, as well as a thousand or so um, broilers. And so I'll be interjecting some questions along the way. Um, after Chris and Mike introduce themselves, I'm going to talk a little bit about some different systems that we'll be looking at today. Please be sure to start dropping your questions um, into the chat. We want to try to allow as much time for questions today as possible. Chris? Unmute yourself, Chris. There we go. That sounds a lot better than just seeing my lips move. Uh, thank you, Hannah. My name is Chris Pierce. I'm with Heritage Poultry Management Services. Uh, we're located in Lebanon County in Anvil. Um, we are a, a business that uh, works directly with egg farmers um, on the production side of things from the farm level. We have poultry nutritionists on staff and we have uh, certified poultry technicians and really the production and nutrition bird health is really where our expertise is. So uh, we're quite active uh, within the uh, uh, providing eggs for a number of different uh, regional egg, uh, egg companies. And um, I spent a lot of my time uh, in risk management and trying to figure out how do we help our farmers succeed through the various challenges that we face. Okay, and uh, my name is Mike Badger. I'm with American Pastured Poultry Producers Association. Uh, I represent independent pastured farms across the country, um, you know, direct marketing, style farms, uh, which Hannah mentioned that she is doing with her eggs. And so I have a keen interest in, in helping our members understand the risks associated with, with this and providing education to our, to our, our base and just kind of helping everybody do their jobs a little bit better and, and more efficiently. Mike, could you just quickly mention maybe the, the breadth of the size of farm that's represented by APA? Sure, so we have about a thousand member farms uh, active at any given time across the United States um, of all sizes. You know, we, we run from a couple hundred layers, a thousand or two broilers all the way up to much larger scale. Um, our biggest egg farm, I think is 40,000 hens on pasture, rotationally grazed. And uh, he's out in California. And, you know, our largest broiler farms are couple hundred thousand. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike and Chris, for, for joining today. As I mentioned, I wanted to go ahead and just talk a little bit, um, next slide, about semantics. Um, there's a big difference between the way USDA APHA sort of refers to our farms and the way we might on an everyday basis refer to our farms. Next slide. So APHIS, um, really when they're out there talking, they're talking about what they say as commercial flocks or backyard flocks. 
to clarify this, um, backyard flocks would be any that are fewer than 75,000 uh, egg layers or fewer than 200,000 birds a week slaughtered for meat type chickens. You can read the definitions there. And then a commercial flock would be larger flocks than as specified above. So keep in mind when you're listening to USDA um, APHIS, that's what they're thinking in their, in their mind. Now, of course, in the everyday language that we use, we would call a backyard flock a homesteader or someone who has residential pets and a commercial flock any farm that files a Schedule F. So we are not going to cover uh, backyard flocks today. You can go to the next slide. So everybody has knows this, <laughs> you know, in their mind. We're not going to talk about backyard flocks today. The next few slides, um, the first, these first three are of what we would call outdoor access systems. And so Chris is going to talk about this, particularly, you know, a lot of our organic um, layer members would have outdoor access systems. You could go to the next slide. And then this next slide as well depicts that system. And when we're talking about pastured systems, and Mike will talk about this a little bit, these are slides from my own farm. Um, and so we're talking about where hens are out on pasture and moved in rotation. So I just wanted to give a little bit of context there. We have to remember um, to sort of filter some of the language that's used to make sure we understand exactly what we're talking about. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Chris, who's going to talk to us about um, sort of an overview of where we are with um, high path AI, and in particular, some of the things we want to think about in these outdoor access systems. So thanks, Chris. Thank you, Hannah. So we are at a unique uh, place in time outside of all the other world events. So set those things aside. I know you see it and live it and breathe it. Right now, we're gonna focus on uh, high path avian influenza. Um, you might've seen some information maybe through some of your chats. And I know Pasa talked about it at your recent annual meeting. Uh, the headlines of Lancaster farming this, this past week uh, was 1.6 million birds culled from avian influenza. Um, there's a lot going on. And, um, and that really applies to, to really everyone that has feathers in their backyard, whether you have 20,000 birds that you're producing for, you know, for a local um, uh, egg company or whether you have less than that. So uh, the map that's in front of you um, actually was created by um, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Uh, Dr. Brightbill is our state veterinarian and one of his team members created this. And I thought this actually was a really good graphic. So this kind of helps show a little bit of what the challenge is. So as you can see, we're starting in the central part of the United States and going over the East, East Coast. So um, this is really showing what the flyway looks like. Uh, this graphic here that you can see the flyway, you know, so the, the bluish color birds, of course, are gonna be the Atlantic flyway. And then we're gonna move into um, the central flyway, Mississippi flyway and Pacific flyway. But um, you'll notice like even as we get over into um, you know, Illinois and Indiana, some of those bluish color birds are intermingled with the greenish color birds and even vice versa. Uh, so this is showing the migration that's starting and we all hear it and we all see it. Um, you know, we see the sky full of whether it's snow geese or Canadian, you know, Canadian geese or, you know, we'll see swans and a lot of other things, but this is really where the issue is happening. So, um, and if you look at this, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, that's really just them showing the density of poultry in South Central Pennsylvania. So that's not avian influenza. There's been no confirmed cases of avian influenza uh, in Pennsylvania at this point in time. That, that graphic's just trying to show where the poultry is. So, um, you know, it's just some current numbers because this graph here was created in, you know, last week, March 3rd. Lots changed then. So Dr. Crystal and Woods with USDA uh, gave an update yesterday. I'll just, just share some numbers. So to date, in, in this calendar year, 2022, there's been 23 confirmed cases of high path AI. It's an H5N1. It's a Eurasia. It's the same influenza that actually Western Europe is dealing with right now. If any of you have any friends or contacts or follow what's going on within Western Europe, I, I follow British, uh, the, the United Kingdom really closely. Um, you know, they're, they've killed uh, close to 2 million birds so far. They just passed their 100th farm, uh, free range turkeys, uh, broilers, 
and layers, but it's the same strain of avian influenza that's impacting the United States. So some of these numbers, like I said, there's 23 specific um, either commercial or backyard domestic flocks have been confirmed positive. Um, they're in 12 different states. Um, even since this graph was created, there were two confirmed commercial turkey farms in uh, Buena Vista County, Iowa. Um, and I, there may not be anybody in this, uh, this webinar from there, but that county in Iowa back in 2015, when over 35 million um, turkeys and layers were euthanized because of high path influenza, that county was one of the many counties that they lost a couple million birds. Um, so that was kind of big news that that happened just the beginning of this week that we're talking about that it's commercial production in Iowa. Um, so USDA, you know, it was anticipating. So they, they did a lot more um, wildlife monitoring, uh, bird detection. And so far, that's what some of these dots are here. When we look at the wild birds, that's the blue dots. And um, there's none in Pennsylvania yet, but we can see, you know, Virginia and Maryland and Delaware and New York and up in New Hampshire and Maine and Florida and the Carolinas. So those blue dots are indicating uh, a, a, a group of 307 wild bird detections that have been noted nationwide. Uh, it was announced last week that there was a, a bald eagle in uh, British Columbia, which would be the Pacific Flyway that was confirmed to have H5N1. So they announced that all flyways in North America have now had birds confirmed, whether they're wild or the commercial domestic that we've talked about with high path avian influenza. Um, and again, it's high pa highly pathogenic. So that really means that uh, it can really spread from, from one bird to the next. The concerns with the, with the migratory waterfowl is, um, is the bird can shed, can have the virus, but it may not be impacted its specific health from the virus. It can be a carrier. We've all lived through COVID, so we've all heard some of this stuff, uh, but as we, sh as we shift into poultry, the migratory waterfowl can be a carrier, which means their feces, you know, their, their, their feces could have the virus. So if they're, you know, droppings, they go everywhere, um, whether it's parking lots or in fields or it's near your farm or somebody else's farm. So that, that is some of the concerns that, and you can get to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, that's why as, as we look at some things, we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we protect our flocks, no matter what our production system is? And again, today, as, as Hannah shared, our expertise or focus is really on the outdoor access types of farms. And, and, um, and what are we looking for? And, and well, it's all about communication. So the Center for Poultry and Livestock Excellence in partnering with PASA, we're just trying to get the message out to everyone, to get the information. You might have seen, if you get Lancaster Farming, there was a full page ad in Lancaster Farming this past week, and there will be the next two weeks, because we're trying to get that communication out there. And maybe your feed providers sharing this information with you, or if you buy baby chicks or pullets, or, you know, we're trying to share this information with everyone, because the weakest link, weakest link of, of a challenge is those that maybe don't know about it, and then those that maybe aren't taking additional precautions. So here's a whole list of things that uh, could be symptoms that you can be looking for. And really for your birds, you're looking for those changes. You, you start to see some increase in mortality, and it may start out with just a few, and then it can change rapidly. And, and, and the birds can become quiet. You, you guys know who, how your birds are, how they normally act, what the stresses they feel are. And again, these are some of the symptoms and you can go to the, to the next page, next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the symptoms that we're looking at. But as we look at, you know, what steps can you take? And I think that's the thing that I really wanna focus on today is what can you do at your farm to protect you and your farm as well as your neighbors? And, um, and these are things that you may have heard of before back if you were producing back in 2015, when it was a thousand miles away you kind of looked at things a little bit different than when it's maybe 30, 60, or 80 miles away. And um, in 2015, we didn't have near the amount of activity. And uh, like I said, we have 12 states. In 2015, it was three states. It was Nebraska, Minnesota, and Iowa. You know, we're, we're East Coast, West Coast, I mean, East Coast uh, and Central part of the country. So the things I'm looking at is how do you minimize things? So the, like the biggest thing is don't wear the shoes you wear outside inside you know take your shoes off put a pair of crocs on or some other shoes that haven't had any exposure outside you can find them pretty inexpensive it's good to have some disinfectant you know and make sure you know if you're organic that it meets your organic certification if you're not organic 
use Clorox or something, you know, and replace it because the, the viability of the disinfect, it doesn't last forever. So it's important that you, you know, if you spend, you know, $20 a, this month for disinfect to save your hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of birds, that's really important. Um, things that we're looking at is, is those touch areas. Now for the outdoor access farms, uh, depending on who your certifiers are, there's a number of different welfare certifications, Whole Foods and American Humane and Certified Humane and your organic certifier, whoever that may be. We work with Pennsylvania Certified Organic. They're all aware of these concerns, and they, but they all have a different method that you need to follow in order to request temporary confinement of your flocks. You can't just confine them, but they're very cooperative. You have to document this in your organic system plan if you're organic or if you're one of the third party animal welfare certifications. They understand this. They understand the risk that's out there, but you need to follow those protocols. So what I would encourage you to do is to uh, you know, check with who your, your partners are, whether it's your egg company or your feed company, who you're working with. But some of these practices that are really important is trying to protect your flock from having the exposure of what the migratory birds for Mike, and I'm really hoping that you have questions because that's really a way that, you know, we can be specific to what your questions are on your farm. What should you be looking for? What should you do? And things such as that. So, so Hannah, that, that's, um, that's 10 minutes there. And I want to make sure that I respect uh, the time that we have this afternoon. Thanks, Chris. Mike? <clears throat> yeah, so um, I just want to say that I took a look through some of the participants and I just want to, when I opened up, I said we service uh, farms across the country, across the US, but we actually have some Canada members and I saw some of them on the on this webinar today. So I just want to acknowledge them. Um, so we come at this from, we have a lot of, we have a lot of concerns in an outbreak such as this, like this, this virus specifically in pastured poultry challenges our method, right? We, we constantly, we can't avoid the messaging and the, the constant, um, you know, uncertainty of putting our birds outside in, in an environment where they could be susceptible to, you know, passing waterfowl, which is our common reservoir at the moment. So a lot of, a lot of questions. And we all started biosecurity and that's the slide we have here, but I, I'd actually like to suggest that this is the wrong place for us to start. Um, biosecurity is one of those things like it's it's a last line of defense. And if biosecurity fails, where do you go? Um, you go, we all know where you go, right? Um, it ends with CO2 or shut down ventilation systems and, and a lot of death. You know, there's just biosecurity while it works and can work, it, it fails, right? That's why we still have these outbreaks. And so I wanna try to have a holistic picture of what it means to raise our birds in this threat. And, and first of all, my, my first primary advice is don't panic, right? Just don't panic. Um, there's a way through this. And after you don't panic, then let's actually look at the risk. And risk is a two-sided coin, right? There's, there's a risk of how likely am I, how susceptible is my flock to getting uh, this virus? And if I get, if my flock does get infected, how, what, what's my risk of spreading that? And to turn, to answer this question, like one of the things that really helped me answer this question and put this in perspective, believe it or not, comes from APHIS back in 2016 on the heels of the, the outbreak that we had in, in 14 and 15. And there's this crazy little interim rule about how to handle conditions of payment for indemnity claims, right? So when, when your flock is, is positive, confirmed positive, uh, USDA comes in and takes over the response, depopulates all the birds. You get paid for the birds that weren't initially killed through the virus, right? The, the, the birds that were depopulated, you get reimbursed for them. And so there were some questions about how to handle that contract grower arrangement. APHIS put out some details clarifying that. They made all these rules, a lot around biosecurity, but they made exemptions, exemptions for certain size farms Hannah actually showed that slide earlier about the, the size of the farms that they use. I think they're the same sizes. And exempted some of those farms from having some of the, the biosecurity pieces in place at the time of the, 
of the outbreak. They didn't, they didn't say biosecurity wasn't necessary, but some of the plans and some of the paperwork and some of the formalities of that biosecurity was exempted on these smaller facilities. And the reason they said that was simply because there was less risk. There was less viral load in these smaller facilities, smaller farms. And, and even when the farms, if the farms contracted HPAI, there was less risk of shedding that virus out into the broader public because they weren't connected to as many farms. Like pastured poultry farms, they're operators of one typically. That's the norm. There's a few exceptions out there, but they're typically operators of one. And so they don't have service techs handling, you know, thousands of birds across dozens of farms, for example, and feed trucks aren't coming in and out across their farms. And there's just a lot of less equipment sharing and people sharing. And so that's the risk. And I think we understand that. And when we start to understand that and we understand the virus, we can look for the advantages in a pasture system. We know this virus doesn't hold up to UV light. It's very fragile. It, it, it prefers cool, moist environments. And, and this whole idea of viral load plays into the intense confinement of the birds that typically get are, are in the news here that, you know, a million, 1.2 million and 15,000 turkeys here and, you know, 20,000 layers here. And while we do have these smaller flocks, 100 backyard mixed poultry species and eight birds up in New York and that kind of stuff, the, the tendency clearly is that cause a lot of damage and impact on these intensely confined flocks. And so we start with that. We start with a, that assessment of a risk. And I won't tell you today how to run your biosecurity. Um, we, I will share some things that I think are common sense from a pastured poultry perspective. I won't even tell you whether you should or shouldn't put your, your birds outside. I know what I would do. You ask me what I would do, I would tell you. Um, but I think we play to our advantages. Low stocking densities on our farms, sunlight, um, low stress environments, smaller numbers of birds, that is our advantage. And I think as a pastured poultry growers who have largely rejected the, the status quo mo idea of raising uh, chickens and turkeys and other poultry, we lean on that. And we lean on the things that got us here, which are those things I mentioned, plus high, the highest quality feed possible. It's the rotationally grazed um, systems that we use to keep birds on fresh pasture. And just to qualify, when I talk about pastured poultry, Hannah showed her pictures. That's a classic, excellent, beautiful example of pastured poultry. Those birds are moved to fresh pasture very often and frequently. Uh, they're not continuously grazing the same, the same paddock and they're not bedded in a house. They're, they're out. This time of year is a little bit different. Hannah's birds are probably enjoying some inside comfort instead of the snow today. But I guarantee you she has more stocking density or lighter stocking density in her hens than you'll find in just about any commercial operation out there. And I think that's an advantage that we have to leverage. Um, it's one of our, it's one of the things that helps us. And so when we, when we think about all these things, again, this is just informing what we do and how we think about it and remember not to panic. Um, when it comes to actual biosecurity, you know, my, my take on this is pretty simple. You build the healthy immune system, which is what I was just talking about with the feeding and the, the, exposure to the environment. Believe it or not, people in pasture poultry circles think that exposure to soil, exposure to sun, exposure to the environment is a healthy thing. It's a good thing because it, it, it has a chance to strengthen an immune system where when, when a threat comes at it, it has a chance to react and, and defend itself. If you, you know, I don't, I didn't go walking around in the last two years in a bubble in, in the world in, in a styrofoam bubble protecting myself from anything that happened. I mean, there might be some social commentary. I don't mean it to be, but I didn't do that. And not, nobody that I saw did that, right? We still relied on our immunity and our defenses to, to protect us against that virus. And that's the same thing here. And we protect our birds. Biosecurity comes all we have. And when that fails, where do we go? And so I think we should look further up the chain and start there. And then we come back to biosecurity as a, as a layered on part of our defense. And simple, no, I think the simple things that, that 
we can do. Don't water your flocks out of ponds. Like I see that happen sometimes with some of the backyard flocks that were detected over the years. There's so oftentimes a pond involved. Um, some of our own pasture growers tend to have ponds that they let birds kind of wander in and out of at will. I think that's a bad idea. Uh, it's a pretty easy thing to, to stop. Um, use the dedicated boots for your chores. I think Chris mentioned something like that. Don't share equipment. Um, you know, don't share dirty equipment, clean it, that kind of stuff. If you're at risk, restrict those feed trucks, delivery vehicles to non-production areas of your farm. Keep them out of, away from your birds. Source your poultry from reliable sources. You know, um, that would be theoretically an MPIP certified hatchery. Um, I know I do a lot of pullets. Those birds are tested before they're moved for avian influenza, among some other things. And um, you know, avoid poultry shows, fairs, backyard flocks, where you just don't know what's happening with them. You don't know their, their systems. And I think that's a, if you start there and you start with those things, I think you're off to a really strong start. And, and are you at risk? The answer, the short answer is always yes, you're at risk. Your flock is at risk because this is a virus that targets chickens and, and ducks and turkeys. And your, your ducks are probably carriers or not visibly infected. But, you know, having some risk is that's just the way it is you know so we, you do the best you can to protect yourself and and make the choices that are they're good for your farm and your situation and um you, you're i think you'll, you'll get further ahead in the game so I, i'll stop there i want to leave plenty of time for questions thanks mike so if you do suspect high path ai in your flock um, really, the only way to confirm it is through laboratory testing. So we ask that you call your state veterinarian. I see that Dr. Brightbill is actually on the call with us today. So um, we might get some questions that if he's willing, we'll be, um, be happy to have him answer those questions as well. There's the USDA hotline. You can call your state extension office. Um, PASA members, feel free to call our helpline and we'll help you get to PDA or USDA. And I'm sure APA would do the same. I'm sure that, that you know, Chris would be willing to do the same. We're all, all willing to help. Um, remember that surveillance testing is free. So, um, before we move into questions, I just wanted to, um, address probably the most challenging um, uh, issue <laughs> on this situation. We saw that, you know, um, Dr. Brightville um, mentioned on the chat that the position, um, his position is that birds should be moved inside. And I think that that was the same issue we had last time with HPI was the um, disagreement around that. And so um, I don't know if we'll get a chance to, <laughs> to talk about that a little bit more today. Love um, Dr. Brightbill. I don't know if we have the ability actually to have you um, be audible today, but certainly you could drop something in the chat. Um, and I know Mike, your position would, would differ from that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so um, let's see. We did have a request for a link to the flyways map, if that could possibly be dropped in the chat. Um, if we can't do that right now, we'll make sure that that gets. Um, and that's, and Hannah, we might be able to get a, an updated map from Dr. Brightbill on that because okay. that's kind of a living document. Mm -hmm. the, the, the one thing that Dr. Brightbill shared yesterday, we had a, a call. Um, that the Department of Ag put on. Uh, they've been in, Dr. Brightbill's been in dialogue with the state vet for both Maryland and Delaware because they both had, have confirmed cases of high, uh, high path AI. Um, I believe it was the vet, the state vet from Delaware shared that they, they were doing some testing of, uh, of the beautiful snow geese. And, um, and the data that they showed, and actually Dr. Brightbill might be able to include this in the chat. He said that the 20% of the Canadian snow geese, they Canadian, the snow geese they tested were positive as a carrier of the Eurasia H5N1. Like it was a sick, it was twenty percent, which is eye opening because um, we've seen tens of thousands of snow geese. Um, but again, that's that that's some of the concern. 
Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we certainly could, I mean, we're gonna see Dr. Brightbill if we can get you situated as, as a panelist to be able to talk. I think the main thing, and I'm, I'm gonna let Mike jump in here too, is I, I think there's a valid argument to say, just as we would say with any virus, that confinement has consequences. And so, yes, we want to be very vigilant in terms of trying, you know, I saw that Dr. Brightville mentioned potentially bringing food and water inside and limiting the amount of access that wild birds would have to food. Um, the importance of in pastured systems that birds are being moved to fresh grass consistently. So they're not eating over um, grasses where wild birds may have um, pooped for lack of a better word. Um, so I, I think that th this is something that we really have a challenge to sort of work through this here. And it looks like I don't know, Mike, if you want to go ahead, I think we might be able to get Dr. Brightbill in too. Yeah, I think I think you hit it, Hannah. The, it, it, in my in, in my observation, right, and we look at we look at 50 million birds from the past, you know, 50 million plus birds in 14, 15, 16, and 17, and it was very clear which which systems that this virus chose and favored. Um, now, pasture, when we're talking pasture, we have to understand that we're not talking backyard flocks that are in a covered run or something like that. There's, there's, a, there's an intentionality and a, a specific focus for pasture flocks and what that is and what they are and what they are not. And I think it's, it was very clear the type of environments that, these, that the virus favors and causes the most impact in. And those in, are intense confinement environments. Um, and so the idea of taking your birds as a, as a response to the threat and moving them into an environment that could create the very conditions that this virus thrives in, I, I have a hard time telling my constituents that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't ring, it doesn't, it doesn't even, jive with their philosophy of why they're raising these birds in the way that they are to begin with. And I think that's the, <laughs> that's the challenge you mentioned, Hannah. Um, you know, this time of year, the birds are definitely inside in Pennsylvania, right? Um, and broilers are not quite on farm yet. And the folks that are doing turkeys, they're not, they're not on farm yet. So those risks don't start to materialize for us until you know, broilers are hitting pastures some maybe end of March this year if they're really early. Um, and, and they'll have a little bit of time to contend with, with an outdoor uh, pressure of the virus. But the layers are already inside. And, but they'll be going out the pasture here this month and, and definitely by April. And I just, you know, I think for me, the, the numbers, the, the history tells us that you know, biosecurity just fails. You know, it, it's what else can we do with our birds to, to protect them? And, you know, a good, a good defense is a good offense sometimes. And I think that putting our birds in the environments where they thrive is, is a good call. It's, it's, it's certainly not a call everybody will make. But for the most part, I think when I look at APA members, I, I don't know anyone that would hold their birds back through the summer or through the spring and keep them inside um, state mandate or not, <laughs> you know, they would, you'd death to find them. That's, that's my take on it. Yeah, and Hannah, you know, we're and actually Dr. Brightbill, I think he's on here now, but yep. you know, yep. we're, gonna have, we're gonna have differences of opinions. And actually that's probably what I love most about our country. And uh, we're staying out of politics, but we are, we're, we're passionate about what we do and we're very, um, we're very opinionated in what we do too. So, and I know that, I know Mike's passionate about what he does. And, and I know, you know, the producers I work with is a different model. It is more intensive, you know? And the funny thing is the 20,000 birds that we're working with is big versus what you have, Hannah. 
but it's dwarf versus the half million bird caged house, the 20,000 is the little guy. So like, mm -hmm. it's all in perspective, but Dr. Brightbill, or, or, I see you're connected. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, from, from your position where you're saying, and, and you know, th there's risk aspects and we're talking about the virus load and, and, and feces and the migratory flocks. I would value some of your feedback. Yeah, Dr. Brightbill, if you wouldn't mind responding to the um, bringing birds in comment, but then also we have two questions. One about whether people should restrict uh, customers coming onto their farm and whether there's any risk of zoonotic transmission. I think he's connected. I see him connecting his headset. So, yep. <laughs> uh, yep. Are you there, Dr. Brightbill? You're on mute. I don't know if you're on mute. Okay, I think I'm on muted. There you go. <laughs> hey, I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to just listen in here and the opportunity to comment. Really appreciate um, Mike's comments too, because I do think we have to think about the whole health of the bird and, and those factors, uh, you know, are, are multifaceted that, that impact whether an animal is going to get sick or not. Um, I think much like we've seen over the past two years uh, with COVID, we've learned a lot um, about um, mitigating disease. And a lot of it goes back to social science and how we perceive threats and how we choose to respond to threats. Our agriculture in Pennsylvania is robust and as strong as it is because of how diverse it is. Um, and I really believe that it should be up to the individual to decide uh, whether they choose to keep their animals inside or outside. But I think my role as a state animal health official is to talk about relative risk and to provide information for people to make informed decisions. Um, I do think that these are unprecedented times when we just look at the sheer numbers of birds testing positive um, in the Eastern uh, Flyway. Um, yes, Dr. Heather Hurst um, did inform me yesterday that they looked at snow geese and 20% of snow geese in what they sampled in Delaware is testing positive for the Eurasian H5 strain. Um, so, you know, th this is something that if you look what happened in Africa and Israel, it's been devastating, not to just um, commercial poultry, but wild waterfowl. We haven't seen a strain like this that's killing, uh, you know, not only millions of, of birds um, in captivity, but also hundreds of thousands of birds um, in the wild. And so that just shows how, how things have how things have evolved, and that's why when I think about a, a risk abatement, I think we need to think about even if our model is based on being outside, can we be smarter with it? You know, I think you were asking some great questions about um, people visiting farms. Well, what about just um, as Hannah said, I typed in the chat about thinking about ways uh, that won't attract um, wild fowl into your pens or allow access. You know, so are there ways to have covered feed access, covered water access that birds can safely get at and feed at and, and they're less likely to be contaminated by wild waterfowl? If so, that's a win. Um, are there opportunities to work with entities such as USDA Wildlife Services uh, that in my opinion is just really a great cooperative resource there to help, um, you know, for abatement strategies to just keep wild waterfowl away knowing the high viral loads in these um, birds. Um, and, and then, yeah, thinking about the strategies that Mike were, was talking about, um, you know, stocking densities, all of that stuff, nutritional planes, stress, all of that, uh, you know, adds in greatly. But I fear what we're dealing with right now is just a super high viral load. We haven't seen anything like this for many years. Um, and, uh, you know, I look at as of yesterday, there was 23 uh, positive flocks. Um, yeah, 13 of them were large commercial. The other ones were smaller types of operations. Um, and a lot of those, um, when you read the situational reports on them, had direct contact or indirect contact with, with wild waterfowl. So, you know, what can we do? It's, it's going to be decisions by each operation on what they, they can do. But anything to avoid direct contact. And, and lessen the chances of indirect can, can really help. But I think, um, as we saw with COVID, just learning about the risk and hearing what's happened in both smaller outdoor operations and 
larger commercial operations and and how this is evolving and spreading so quickly uh, is concerning and, and it's a reason for us all to think about what do we feel is appropriate for our operation to mitigate risk to, uh, risk to the extent that we feel comfortable with. Thank you, Dr. Brightbill. Um, we've had a couple questions about if it's possible to transmit to humans, um, in particular people who are immunocompromised or young children. Yeah, so first I have to give the disclosure for the press office and for my veterinary license that I am a DVM. I'm not an MD or a DO. <laughs> so I encourage everybody to read. Um, if you Google CDC um, USDA 2022 HPAI, um, you'll see that they present information there that relays that at this time, uh, the risk to humans is low. Um, I'm aware of one case in, um, in England, um, in a smaller outdoor operation where the owner had a lot of day in and day out contact with sick birds, and they unfortunately got sick with it. Um, I think since uh, 1996, uh, roughly 800, there's been 865 cases and a little over 400 deaths. So this virus has been along for around, around for a long time. It's just really changed and adapted um, that, as Chris shared earlier, it's unfortunately plenty of waterfowl carry it. It doesn't kill them. It will kill some wild waterfowl like seagulls, and, and uh, we've seen it some in Canadian geese with neurologic signs. Uh, and, but one neat thing about it is we're just not seeing those human health implications. However, that said, certainly when you get into sick birds, that's another reason to just give us a call um, because We'll go out, we'll quickly do the testing, the testing's free, um, and that enables um, you to have peace of mind that it's not AI, uh, and, and you can go on with figuring out what might be going on, consulting with the paddle system to get other answers. Uh, but we're not here to stomp out flocks. We're not here to stomp out business models. We're here to mitigate disease so that um, all you know varieties of agriculture can be successful. So. Thank you. Um, just quickly, before we move to the next question, uh, there was a question about whether or not wild turkeys are impacted. Yes, so that, that question came up on another um, call uh, with, with uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission. And to my knowledge, uh, you know, we have not seen anything affecting wild turkeys. Now there are turkey flocks in other states right now that are getting it for whatever reason commercial turkeys are more susceptible to AI than other species. So anytime I get a commercial sick turkey call, I'm always leery of wanting to rule that one out quick. In the past week, we've had 15 sick bird calls. So mm -hmm. we're out and about. Um, we always ensure that the person's observing the appropriate downtime if they were on a sub subject or premise until we know that that premise is negative. But uh, and Hannah, going back to your other question about should I allow farm access? Uh, yeah, I mean, these are your customers, but I think use common sense of if you're going to walk in my pen, you're going to wear boot covers or I'm at least going to have you scrub your boots off. Um, I had a slide the other day that showed that 90% of the virus can be eliminated just by eliminating the dirt that it's stuck in. The other 10% uh, will be taken away after you've taken the dirt off just the contact to disinfect. So. Okay, thank you. Um, just so that we're sure to get this in before we finish, Mike and Chris, can you each just mention what are the resources available as far as sharing information, both through APA and through um, the center? Yeah, so uh, I'll go first. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> um, so I, I know Penn State University actually the, the, is a great resource. And actually, I, I see you have it listed on there. Uh, Penn State is, is uh, trying to be a central source of information. So you can see the web address there. And they're keeping it current uh, with you know current challenges that are out there. They'll link in, I believe, to USDA as well as what are the tools out there? What, what, what are tools that are available for me to potentially try to, again, different production models are gonna look at things differently, but what tools are out there? And actually just Google USDA HPAI and you're gonna be able to see some data that's showing the, the statistics and information that way. Okay, thanks. 
And Mike, what are the ways that APA members can get information through APA? Yeah, so I, I put a, uh, a resource center on the APA website, APA.org. And you can just go there, click on the banner on the homepage. Um, it has pretty much all the stuff that we published in 2015. It kind of shows, you know, the things I talked about earlier about, you know, for protecting yourselves and, and accounting for the pastured model, as well as some of the more current resources that I have. My, my interview with uh, Dr. Wood is, is listed there, um, where we went back and forth on some of these issues at the PASA conference. Um, it was a, a really nice conversation. Um, and so that's, that's where I would, that, that's where I would point stuff people when that has links out to defend the flock and other USDA resources that, that are the, you commonly see. Okay. And I know you have a monthly call in. Is this something that people would be able to discuss on those call ins at all? Yeah, we do a, a monthly, we call it ask APA. It's the second Tuesday of the month. And, um, you know, it's pretty much, we address questions that, that pop up and, uh, yeah, it would definitely be applicable. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see. I'm just Dr. Brightville. There's some a couple of questions that lead me to believe um, people are interested in what you meant when you said sort of this is different in terms of the degree to which wild birds are being um, or wildlife is being impacted. Yeah, so typically with um, high path avian influenza, what we most commonly see is a low path strain that does not result in sick, sick wildlife or, or sick wild birds. Um, in this case, um, this, this virus started out in uh, Guangdong province of China in 1996, where it affected some people in a community and some um, geese and uh, also uh, domestic poultry. And then it evolved from there. Um, and it's what really changed over the past three years with this virus is that it is a high pass strain that's commonly carried by wild waterfowl, but um, now it's resulting in, in massive die offs of, of wild waterfowl. So um, typically, uh, especially species like ducks, the virus is going to just live in their gastrointestinal tract and not cause disease, and they'll spread it. Uh, I, I see why I see wild waterfowl right now. It's kind of like dive bombers, just leaving little packages. And if we're not careful, we can track them in. Um, but the uh, the real challenge is for wildlife is for whatever reason this has adapted in such a way um, that it's it's long term carried by wild waterfowl, but it kills some of them. And that the fact that it killed wild waterfowl is a concern because that's not something that's normally seen. Thank you for that clarification. Um, we did, would you be able, Dr. Brightville, to, um, or maybe it was just dropped in, people are looking for a link for the map. Yeah, I just did the one that Dr. Brightville gave me on March 4th, but we can try to update that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sir. So what I'll probably do, Chris, is have um, our ADT coordinator send you an up-to-date map, and then you can distribute it that way. Um, I want people to know that that map was our creation. USDA provides that line list that simply says a county. Um, those dots are the geographic center of counties. They are not indicative of the actual location because we don't know. We just know it's within a county. So. Okay. Thank you. All right, we have only about five minutes left. So I thought maybe um, what I do, I'm not seeing other questions at this time. I thought maybe what I would do is just ask um, each of the three of you for just some closing thoughts before we, before we end. Um, Chris, do you wanna go first? Sure, um, again, just it's not business as usual. Again, as I look at the outdoor access farms, uh, don't need to live in fear, uh, you know, just, but just taking, you know, looking over those little things that maybe you just take for granted. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, it's just looking at those factors, um, you know, and, and having conversation with people, 
Um, you know, those that come onto the farm, maybe limit, limit for the, we're talking about the farms of the outdoor access. I understand that's going to be a different model, maybe some others out there, but, um, you know, taking those extra steps, you know, as you think about how your feed's made and what are you storing outside? Are you borrowing equipment from other farms, other neighbors? Can you disinfect it if it's been sitting outside or sitting in a barn, you know, for a period of time, but like, just, just don't assume these are normal days. So, uh, but again, don't live in fear, but take those extra steps to protect your investments. Thank you, Chris. Um, Dr. Brightbill. Yeah, I just uh, really appreciate um, everyone's efforts and we're gonna get through this, we're gonna get through it together, but I think the important thing is to remain calm and be consistent. Whatever strategies you currently have in place now for caring for your birds and, and ensuring like Mike was saying about their their health and welfare, their immune systems, that's all important. You know, the icing on the cake for me is anything we can do to just try to decrease the likelihood of interactions, especially direct or indirect contact. So I think abatement strategies, talking about wildlife services, about how to distract wild birds from coming on. Uh, and also um, anything you can do uh, that you're not concentrating uh, your birds with areas where wild birds might want to come in. So looking at netting, over top to keep those birds from landing. And also they're gonna be attracted to outdoor food and water. So if there's a way to have those in covered areas that your birds access and it's harder for them or impossible for them to access can greatly decrease the, the chance of exposure. But um, we'll get through it together. I don't want anybody to fear calling us. We're available 24 um, seven. There's five of us on call vets and then we just dispatch a vet um, to go out and get those samples um, we post quarantine, that quarantine is just there to protect you and your neighbors. The quarantine is immediately released, you know, at, at such time, um, the negative test result comes in. And, uh, I, I keep, um, you know, having good fortune with, with negative test results, but with what's going on in, in Maryland and Delaware and recent announcements now that they not only have it in layer flocks, but also broiler flocks just goes to show, uh, the closer to the water you are, um, the more likely you are to, to get some uh, traffic that you, you just don't want that's carrying some bad baggage. So wish everybody luck. Uh, don't hesitate to call us. We're a resource to help you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Brightville. Mike? Yeah, I just want to make sure I echo the same sentiments. You know, don't don't panic, right? Stay calm. Um, pick, a, pick a way through the, the forest and, and, and do it to the best of your ability and, and do it with knowledge and, and understanding of of everything. That's my biggest thing. You know, I remember being so frustrated in 2015 with the marketing, and I say marketing, but the, the messaging coming out of every press release was we have a, we have an outbreak and backyard flocks don't have any biosecurity and they're going to kill everybody. You know, that's, that was the summation of the, of the messaging. And I'm like, ah, you know, it's crazy. Um, and, and pastured flocks get wiped, caught up in that wash. And, and so the message for pastured flocks here is I think, Stand your ground, do it with confidence, do it with understanding um, and accept the risks that you bear. There are risks and you can't escape those, but I think we can mitigate them and, and navigate them to the best of our ability. And, you know, I'd like to see a conversation. This is my wish list. I'd like to see a conversation that changes, you know, obviously in the middle of an outbreak is not the time, but I'd like to see a conversation that actually asked questions like, is, is this why does this virus seem to have so much negative impact on certain operations? Where is it getting worse over time as our farms consolidate and get bigger and get less genetically diverse? Um, is that, I'd like to see some of those probing questions that, that challenge the way we're doing things. And I know I'm asking for roses and pies in the sky, <laughs> but <clears throat> there's no, there's no, uh, <laughs> that that's a challenge to the status quo, right? But I'd, I'd like to see those conversations start to, to happen and, and say, okay, we got some elephants in the room and, and pastures, you know, there's some elephants in the pasture room too, but, but just say, are we actually doing something that, that adds, adds risk, adds, you know, danger, quote unquote, to the, to the virus? Um, are, are we responsible for, for the way that we're raising our birds and some of it? And, and, I would love to have stats on, you know, like the commercial flocks, how many of them are certified organic? To my knowledge, I, I haven't, I don't know that there are any, um, how many of them are pastured? Um, the backyard flocks, we don't, they're, they're, 
nobody knows what those flocks really are unless you can have access to all the reports. But the, the commercial ones, we pretty much, I think, have an idea of, of growing conditions in there and, and how they're the, the, the raising conditions. And so I'd like to see more focus on an understanding and, and stratifying that data so that we can have some better decisions. Because it seems to me standing, putting our last flag of defense on biosecurity, while I understand it's important, it's going to always fail. It's a human and it's a human led effort. And this outbreak shows that if biosecurity didn't work in COVID. It doesn't, it doesn't keep all the incidences of, of the virus out of our poultry. And, and so what are some other factors and how can we address it? And I'd like to see that conversation going forward. Like I've seen a lot of data from uh, the British free range egg producers. Like uh, the UK has, a, um, and actually I'll try to get it to Hannah. Maybe Hannah can uh, from the UK uh, because I, yeah, but it's like I've seen some of that data that's talking about you know the pastured flocks uh, in the in the UK. And I know it's not North America because I, I don't yeah I can think of data at this point isn't, but it's been been running wild around five months longer in the UK than it has here. So I'll well, actually sounds, try to get some data. it sounds like we have an idea for another webinar next year. Hopefully, when we're we're past all of this. Um, for some really interesting conversation. So before Lucas, uh, you know, wraps all this up, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Brightbill, for jumping in. Um, at PASA, we're always really interested in a vibrant conversation. We aren't always looking um, to agree with every single point, but I think we have just the commonality of wanting the best for our birds, for our farms, for our communities, and Thank you, everyone, for engaging in this conversation. Lucas? Yeah, I'll, Thank I'll you. add Thank you. Hannah just said. And also in the chat was posted a link for an evaluation survey that you can give us feedback um, about this webinar so we can continue to provide um, good quality content um, on topics that are not only um, relevant, like this one is, um, extremely timely, um, but also uh, with the speakers and presenters that, you know, are going to give you the information you want. So big thank you again to all the presenters. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Um, Bright Bill, from, for jumping on. And everyone, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.